couple of stragglers coming in quickly. I'm here to introduce Matthew Chapman, who's going to talk to us about adventures in laptop battery hacking. Uh, Matthew likes to attack problems from first principles and to engineer clean systems that address particular problems as efficiently as possible, which is what led him to his current job at Exablaze, developing high-performance network cards and switches. He holds a BE in computer engineering and a PhD in computer science from the University of New South Wales. Give him a round of applause. Over to you, Matt. Thank you. Um, so I'm probably best known in this community as the R Desktop guy. I was the original author of R Desktop. Um, I used to work on Samba a little bit too. Um, and uh, I, I currently work for a company called Exablaze, developing fast network cards and switches. But this talk is about none of those things. This talk is a little bit about a little bit of an adventure that I had trying to get my laptop battery working. So let's start from the beginning. This is my laptop. It's actually the laptop I'm using here to present this talk. Um, it's a Lenovo ThinkPad X230T. I bought it in August 2013, so about three years ago. Um, when I bought it, um, the, the battery capacity was, uh, at least the rated battery capacity is 62 watt hours. And when I'm sort of surfing the web and um, writing my talk slides and all that sort of stuff, I get about um, I run about 12 watts, so that was giving me about five hours of battery life. So I was pretty happy with that. Then about two years later, um, the reported full charge capacity dropped to about two watt hours. So just let me say it again, it went from 62 watt hours to two watt hours. I'm not sure whether uh, maybe um, one of the cells failed or whether that's just normal degradation over time, but either way, I was only getting about 10 minutes of battery life out of it now, so um, you would say, okay, it's time for a new battery. It's, it's run its course. So I went online. Um, this is a, this battery, the original battery. Um, I, I've got it here. Um, it's a 4N, 45N1079 Lenovo battery, so I went online to batdepot.com. Um, I, I found something that looked like it was a replacement for this battery, add to cart. A few days later it arrived, I put it in my laptop, and I switched on my laptop, and, and this is what it says. The system does not support batteries that are not genuine, Lenovo made or authorized. The system will continue to boot, but may not charge unauthorized batteries. Now I'm not sure what may means, but the battery definitely did not charge. And what's interesting is it didn't charge even when the laptop's off. Like, I would have thought naively that you have your battery, you plug it into the power, it starts charging. But even when the laptop was off, I'd plug it in and the battery wouldn't charge. So something odd was going on. And so I started looking into this. So just to give you some background, um, most, I think probably all uh, in practice laptop batteries implement something called smart battery system. It's a standard industry specification. Um, basically, it specifies a protocol for talking to a smart battery, um, a smart, smart battery being a, a battery with a, with a controller in it, and every laptop battery I know of is a smart battery. Um, so it requires a, a, a clock and data pin for SM bus, which is basically um, I squared C, and a thermistor or safety signal pin. So if we look at the Lenovo battery pinout, it's got um, those three pins and, and plus and minus. It's a fairly standard sort of laptop battery pin out. So the next thing I needed to do is to sniff the communication on the SM bus. The SM bus is what um, the laptop talks to the battery on and finds out capacity, all that sort of stuff. So I wanted to know why it wouldn't charge this battery. So I needed to sniff the battery communication over SM bus. So what I did um, was I took my a logic analyzer, which was a um, little USB SX. I don't think you can buy these anymore, but you can get similar things. Um, and I probed those clock and data signals. Now, it's actually quite convenient in this laptop. There's enough run in the battery contacts that you can put your probes in, and while still having the uh, laptop battery in the laptop. So, so this was handy. I just had it, as you can see here, um, the battery is actually connected to the laptop, but I've got the probes running out of it to the logic analyzer. And then this is the 
um, user interface for the for this logic analyzer program. Um, sorry about the Windows. Um, my my Linux laptop was on the desk up, upside down, so I was using uh, I was borrowing a Windows laptop to to run this software. And basically, you can see it's captured um, on those top two lines. You can see it's it's captured the the clock and data signals. And then one of the cool things about these sort of uh, software packages is they have built-in decoding for protocols. So in this case, this is the I squared C decoder. Um, you can't read that, but I'll show you on the next slide with a bit of cleaning up. It looks something like this. So each each line there is basically a communication over the I squared C SM bus. This is very raw, just the raw bytes going over. Then I went and looked at the SBS specification and I figured out what each of these things means. So when you write it in a little bit more user understandable form, um, this is what's going to the battery. So the laptop asks for um, firstly specification info, which tells it uh, what sort of protocol it's talking. So in this case, the battery returns, I'm SBS 1.1 compliant. Then it reads battery mode, it reads design capacity, design voltage, manufacture date, um, all those sort of all that sort of information about the battery. So that's that's fairly straightforward. This happens with any battery. Um, in fact, even Apple batteries speak SPS. So uh, if if Apple does it, then probably every laptop battery does it, because you know Apple isn't known to follow standards. Then we look a bit further down this capture and we get to something that looks a bit odd. So in the SBS specification, there's some codes that are reserved for manufacturer vendor-specific use. So um, one of those is this optional manufacturer function for. And so they're, they're sending this optional manufacturer function for command with four bytes of data. And then this battery, this is my replacement battery, is returning nothing. And then it tries it again, and the battery doesn't even bother acknowledging the command tries it again, the battery returns nothing, and, and so on. So something's not quite right there. Um, I put my original battery in, and it sends this command, and the battery returns the string Lenovo Japan, and then four other bytes. And this is basically doing challenge response authentication, where it's sending four bytes to the battery, and the battery is responding with the string Lenovo Japan and four response bytes, which are calculated based off the, off the challenge. Um, so this is a little bit unfortunate. So uh, what, what can I do about this? Well, I could, um, I could throw that battery in the trash and I could go and buy a genuine battery from Lenovo. Nah. Um, I, I had this battery. It seemed to work OK, other than the fact it didn't charge. Uh, so I wanted to get it working. Now, I, I admit there could be uh, safety aspects to you know, a genuine Lenovo battery may have better quality control than something random I've bought off the internet. Um, but I mean, I can talk a little bit more about that later if I have time. Um, but I wanted to get this battery working. It was, it was a challenge. So another option I, is I could replace the cells in the original battery with cells from the new battery. So use the original battery controller from the genuine Lenovo battery, but just replace the lithium ion cells in it. This is tricky uh, for a few reasons. One is getting the battery apart is, is difficult. Um, the way these batteries are constructed, they have both, um, both tabs and glue. So in order to break it apart, in order to break the glue apart, you have to apply a lot of force. But when you apply a lot of force, you break the tabs. Um, so it's basically designed not to be neatly deconstructable. So, I mean, mostly it's cosmetic. They do actually um, click back together. So it's possible to get a, get a working battery again, but um, you end up with a bit of damage to your case in the process. Also, when you replace those cells, um, there, is, there is a little battery supervisor chip in there. And if it detects the voltage is going out of range, it blows the fuse. So if you accidentally blow the fuse, then you have to replace the fuse as well. And probably the most concerning thing uh, for, for me was the fact that the flash in this battery stores battery calibration data. And I wasn't sure, like, if I replace the cells, are the new cells going to be working optimally while the controller still has the old calibration data? And of course, I don't know how to reset that. So this is an option, but 
I wanted to investigate other options as well. So another option would be to hack the firmware on the battery to support authentication. Um, this is tricky, obviously. Um, it has been done before. Um, there's, there's a great talk at, uh, from DEF CON uh, about battery firmware hacking, and this guy, Charlie Miller, has uh, done it before with a TI chip. Um, he figured out what the architecture of the microcontroller inside the battery is and managed to program it. So, I mean, this is kind of scary, but batteries have firmware running on them, um, and so you can, in theory, hack batteries. In my case, it was very difficult. I couldn't figure out um, how to unlock the, the firmware update. So, and even if I could, I'd have to figure out how to actually uh, modify the firmware. So this is tricky. Um, again, something that would be cool to do, but it's tricky. Another option would be to add a little microcontroller on the SM bus so that when the battery doesn't respond to that challenge, my microcontroller would respond to that challenge instead. Um, and in my, bat in my laptop, there's a bit of space in the mini PCIe slot, so I could stash the little microcontroller in there. These days, obviously, you can get boards that are pretty tiny. Um, this is not very nice. I mean, I've got, I'd have to add some little, little board, tape it inside my laptop. Um, it's pretty ugly. So this is, this is again, a bit of a last resort. So the other option was to modify my laptop firmware to remove the battery authentication check. And um, I'm foreshadowing, this is, what, this, is what I, this is the path I went down. Now the question is, what, when I say laptop firmware, what do I mean? It's, it's not the BIOS, because the BIOS only runs when the processor's on. Um, and I said before that the battery didn't charge even when the laptop was off. So that means it's not the BIOS. So there's another bit of the computer, which is called the embedded controller. Most laptops have an embedded controller. And it's, it's basically a little microcontroller in the laptop that's powered at all times, even when the laptop's normally off. It's sort of similar to a BMC based load management controller in a server. And it's responsible for power management type stuff, fans. It's also, it also doubles as the keyboard controller. It sits on something called the LPC bus, um, which is basically the ISA bus. Um, I don't know, for, 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 those, for those of you who, like me, are starting to get a bit of gray hair. You'll remember in the 80s and 90s, um, our computers had ISA buses in them. Um, well, yes, in 2017, there's still an ISA bus in your computer. It's called the LPC bus. Uh, and that's where this embedded controller is connected. So um, if you look at that diagram in this laptop, the CPU is talking to the South Bridge, the platform controller hub, and the South Bridge is, is talking to the embedded controller over LPC. So that's how the CPU accesses it. And in my, in my ThinkPad, that embedded controller is um, a chip, the MEC1619. It's basically a chip that's specifically designed for use as an embedded controller in laptops. The microprocessor control, it's a microprocessor core is something called ARC, A-R-C. Um, some of you may be familiar with it, some of you may be less familiar with it. Um, it's an embedded microcontroller. It was originally designed for I, I believe, if my memory serves me correctly, it was designed for Super Nintendo. Uh, it was one of the graphics accelerator cores on the Super Nintendo. Um, and then it got licensed to various other companies. And it's basically one of these embedded microprocessor architectures that's used in various things like ARM and MIPS. Um, you'll find it in set-top boxes, all sorts of things. So, so this has an ARC uh, microprocessor in it. It's got some flash memory, 192K of flash memory and 16K of RAM. So you'll notice there's a lot more flash memory than there is RAM. Um, the program executes out of the flash memory. The RAM is just a little scratch pad RAM um, in case you need a bit of RAM. So then I went to pull apart the embedded controller firmware. This is actually quite easy to do because when you update the system BIOS in this laptop, it also updates the embedded controller BIOS. So if you grab the BIOS update file for the laptop, you can pull the embedded controller firmware out of that. And then I, I disassembled that. Um, there's, there's a GNU tool chain available. Um, and also Interactive Disassembler supports it. So then I went through this 
disassembled firmware, and I was looking for where it does this battery authentication. So the most obvious thing I was looking for is that optional manufacturer function for command that it sends to the battery, uh, which the, the code is 60 decimal um, 3C hex. So I looked through the code for all the references to 60 decimal, and there was this I found which was the most likely candidate where, um, so on the arc architecture, the arguments to a function go in R0, R1, R2, R3, et cetera. And uh, in, in one argument, it passed 60, and then in the next argument, it passed four, which to me was, was a big flag because four was the length of the data that it passed with, the, um, with that um, authentication sequence. So, so this was my hypothesis, um, that that's the code that does it. And then I looked around, and in fact, when I looked around the surrounding code, I, I managed to decode a state machine that looks something like this. So um, there's state zero to six, which is sort of initialization, but then in state seven, it starts this write command to the battery. State eight, it checks whether that's succeeded, et cetera. Then it sends the read command. It gets the data back. It validates the battery response. So if we look closer at this validation of the battery response, um, it, gets the, it gets the response. It calls a validate function. Then it, there's this branch where if the return value of that validation function was not equal to 1, then it branches to a failure path. So basically, if I, if I can just remove that branch, then it will fall straight through to the success path. So that, that's, that seems fairly easy. I just need to remove that branch, and it will fall through and um, act as if the battery um, validation succeeded. But of course, it's, it's always a little bit harder than that. Um, there's checksums in the image. So uh, if we modify the image, I'll have to recalculate the checksums. So at, at a minimum, if you look at the image, the last four bytes, it's a pretty obvious flag when you see um, the Fs are basically the, the end of the flash memory that's unused. And then the last four bytes are um, something random, and that changes in each version. So that's a pretty obvious flag that that's the checksum. Uh, but I couldn't figure out what algorithm it actually was that was used to generate that checksum. So that was, that was one issue. Then something else odd I found while digging through this image was that there's, there's a fairly large section of this image that looks like binary gunk, and usually that means it's either compressed or encrypted. And if you look, if you disassemble the other code, there's jumps into the binary gunk. So that makes encryption more likely than compression because you can't really compress, so you can't decompress in place. Yeah, you can decrypt in place. So my hypothesis was that it's encrypted. And also from a certain offset to the end in each firmware revision, because I downloaded lots of BIOS updates and uh, compared them all, in each, in each revision, um, from a certain offset to the end of that encrypted block changed. So my hypothesis was that there's some cipher block chaining where each block, each 8-byte block depends on the previous 8-byte block. And so once anything changes, the rest of it changes. Going back to what I said before, that there's code jumps into this section, my hypothesis was that it's got to be decrypted before programming to the flash in the embedded controller because like I said before, there's 192K of flash that the program executes out of. There's only 16K of RAM, so it can't decrypt into RAM and execute out of RAM. It's got to be executing out of flash. And so my hypothesis is that it's got to be decrypted before programming. So let's have a look at what the programming process looks like, and hopefully we'll find how that decryption happens. So the way the EC programming works is the BIOS update program, when you run it, it writes the new update to a spare flash memory area in, um, in an SPI flash chip on the, on the motherboard. And then the system reboots. And it's, so it's not actually the BIOS update program that writes the EC firmware. It's the BIOS in an early boot stage. Um, and the reason is that after a certain point in boot, uh, as happens with a lot of these things, um, things are locked down. So you can no longer do the embedded controller update. So it's done by BIOS early in the boot. Um, now, whether or not this is actually extra security, I mean, I could just write my, bio, write my EC update to uh, the, the flash memory area and 
you know, next time the user reboots, it'll get flashed. So it's probably not that much extra security, but this is the way they do it. So in order to find that embedded controller update code, we need to look at the BIOS. The BIOS is um, a UEFI compliant BIOS like most these days. The firmware update file for a UEFI system is something called a capsule. It's basically a standard format of packing together the update. There's various tools that can pull that apart. I use something called the UEFI tool. Um, once you pull it apart, you get lots of little executable modules. Um, basically, this is how the UEFI architecture works. There's lots of executable modules. Each one of the, those is a portable executable. It's basically the same format as a Windows EXE, but obviously they don't run under Windows. They're designed to run in the native EFI environment. Um, and so each of these does a little bit of the initialization, and then they run in a certain dependency order. Um, and by the end of it, you have a working system. So in my Lenovo BIOS, there, there's a module called EC firmware update dxe.efi, which is what actually contains the embedded controller update code. So I, I took that and disassembled it. When you look at that, and you can see we're going like layer, layer by layer down. Um, if, if you're getting lost, don't worry, I'll, I'll come back to uh, a, a bigger picture in a moment. So in this particular BIOS module, what it does, and this is run early in boot, what it does is it looks for an update that was stashed into flash memory by the update program. If it finds a new update, then it uploads a little bit of flasher code to the embedded controller that goes into the embedded controller RAM and it starts executing. Um, and then once the embedded controller is running this little bit of code that's, that has been uploaded from the BIOS, then the BIOS sends the new update image to the embedded controller byte by byte. Now, at this point, it's still encrypted. So that, that block that I was um, wondering about is still encrypted at this point when it's sent to the embedded controller. So if it's still encrypted then, then the hypothesis is that it must be the flasher program, the little bit of code that's now running on the embedded controller that's doing that decryption before it writes it to flash memory. Because remember I said, it's got to be decrypted before writing to flash memory. It's not decrypted by the BIOS, so it's got to be the embedded controller that's doing that. So let's disassemble the flasher program. Now, here, here we hit a, a bit of a snag because the flasher program itself is also encrypted. So when the BIOS sends it down to the embedded controller, the embedded controller then decrypts that, um, runs it, and then that code decrypts the new image that's coming in. So there's a bit of a chicken and egg problem here. The flasher program is encrypted and it's decrypted by the currently running firmware. And the new firmware is encrypted and it's decrypted by the flasher program. So how do we get the decrypted version of the current firmware? Well, there is an answer, and the answer is JTAG. The MEC 1619 has a JTAG interface. Um, for, for those who aren't familiar with JTAG, it's a common interface in, um, in electronics for accessing um, low-level low stuff in chips. Ba basically, it was originally designed because you have these big BGAs these days, and you want to be able to access the pins without having to um, try and stick multimeter probes under, under it or anything like that. Um, but it's also used for flashing and for debug and stuff like that. So this has a JTAG interface, so we can actually read out the flash memory through JTAG. How do we get access to the JTAG? Well, it's, it's actually quite difficult in this laptop. It's, it's located, I, I, I believe, under the, um, uh, what's it called? I keep thinking card bus, but um, it's like uh, PCI, the uh, PCI, whatever it is, the mobile PCI Express slot. So in order to get to it, I have to not only pull the motherboard out, but I have to pull some of the hardware from that slot off the motherboard. So it's really hard to get to this interface. Um, but thanks to Russian hackers, I didn't actually have to pull it apart because I found a dump someone had done on the internet, um, which saved me a lot of effort. So that's the 192K flash memory um, dumped out of a MEC 1619. And indeed, it was decrypted in that flash memory dump. So I pulled this apart. I disassembled it, had a look at the encryption decryption function that's, that's doing the decryption in the firmware. Um, this is a little extract from it. Um, obviously, if you're not familiar with 
uh, reading assembly. Some of this may more, make more sense than, than other bits, but it's basically four, four loads, and, and those, the results of those loads are combined together with add, XOR, and add. Now, this is something that, that looked familiar with, to me um, from staring at various encryption algorithms, and this is Blowfish. Um, so basically, Blowfish takes each, each byte, puts it through an S box, and then combines with XOR, add XOR, sorry, um, add XOR, add. So, and indeed, th this was Blowfish. So that was one part of the puzzle solved. The actual encryption key I found in the firmware. In the firmware, it was stored in the expanded form. So if, um, for a lot of encryption algorithms, including Blowfish, what happens is you have your original key, which is something short, um, and then it gets put through something called a key schedule, which expands it to um, the actual S boxes and round keys that are used for the encryption. Um, in the firmware, it didn't store the original key. It stored this expanded form. Um, but the expanded form is sufficient for both encryption and decryption. So I didn't actually need the original key. I was interested as an academic exercise um, of knowing whether you can recover the original encryption key from the S boxes. And I thought this would be hard in the cryptographic sense. Um, by that I mean maybe not, maybe not brute force hard, but at least cryptanalysis hard. Um, in fact, I was wrong. Uh, it happens occasionally. Uh, there's, there's a user that commented on my blog that found a way to reverse the Blowfish key schedule, and it's, it's, actually, um, it's actually not computationally difficult. You just have to run Blowfish a number of times. And, and this, is the, this is the original key. It's a 256-bit it's a key printed in hex. Um, is it a random 256-bit string? Is it an SHA 256 of, of something? Maybe it's an SHA 256 of Dell sucks. I don't know. Um, it's, it's hard to determine that. But this is the encryption key that's used for that firmware. Um, then once I had that decryption key, I could um, basically disassemble the rest of the firmware, uh, check for other checksums. Um, I found three checksums in total. So there's, there's an outer checksum on that image, which is the thing at the end. Um, that's checked by the bias. If that fails, that's not a big problem. The bias just rejects the update. Um, then there's a post-decryption checksum. Um, if you get that wrong, it breaks the embedded controller. There's also checksums on each section of the image. And that's um, also, if you get those wrong, it breaks the embedded controller. So, this is where you get a little bit nervous, because if you get any of your checksums wrong, and maybe there's some other checksums in here that I haven't found yet, um, then the embedded controller won't boot. So, I mean, fingers crossed, those are the only three. So, I, I wrote some utilities to calculate those checksums and to encrypt and decrypt firmware images. I did that simple patch of the jump with the NOP so that I could disable the battery validation. I wrote that back into the BIOS update file, rebooted, ran the BIOS updater, and then booted my laptop. Oh, sorry, uh, this, is the, this is the first message from the, from the BIOS updater. The, the BIOS updater says an update is not necessary at this time. So this is the first issue I ran into. If the BIOS version hasn't changed, it doesn't do anything. So I had to manually run the dosflash.exe in order to do that uh, to apply that update. So indeed, it works. Um, image flashing done. This is the first stage before it reboots, and then it reboots and actually does the EC update. So at this point, um, my my heart was beating pretty hard. Uh, I was a few seconds away from either seeing something cool or um, having a brick in my hands. So I guess we'll find out. And it comes up with the same message as it, as it did before. So, so back, back to the drawing board. Um, so, so what it turns out, so I'd modified state 12, the va validate battery response, but some of the time, randomly, basically. So some boots, it was failing at state 8 instead because um, the laptop would send the right command, and sometimes the battery wouldn't respond at all. So basically, to, to be on the safe side, I just made state 8 always succeed as well. So it goes straight through that state machine. Um, and then let's try, try this. 
Well, I, the, it says now, the battery installed is not supported by this system and will not charge. So now it's a little bit more definite. I guess um, that, that's progress. So, so let's sniff again what's happening on the SM bus. Um, what I found is that if the first authentication sequence passes, it then sends another one. Um, why, why this is? Well, my guess would be that at some point someone's broken the other one. The other one's only four bytes in, four bytes out. You can probably um, brute force all the combinations, store them in a table. So um, they've added another one where it's 17 bytes in, which is probably 16 plus one, and 25 bytes out, which is probably 16 plus eight plus one. Um, and so this is obviously a more, more complicated, perhaps the cryptographic scheme that they've implemented here. But I went back to my state machine and I found some more states. So below that state 12, then it goes and um, chooses a, a challenge number for the second challenge. Uh, it, it sends that second challenge, then it does that exactly the same process for the second, for the second challenge. So of course what I did was I now um, patch those same states in the second challenge. So I've, I've patched out the first write not succeeding, I've patched the first validation, I've patched the second write not succeeding, I've patched the second validation. And it works. Yeah. Finally, <laughs> the, battery, the battery charges. And, and this is my BIOS uh, setup screen. Um, and I've, I've put my initials in the embedded controller version just because I can. <laughs> so I posted a write up. Um, it, was, it was read by a few friends. And then one of my friends shared to Hacker News. And then my website got slash dotted. Um, my hosting service had a um, maximum on the, on the number of clients. So, um, so it, it fell over pretty quickly. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a fun story about this. The, this was early in my relationship with my current girlfriend. I think it was my, like my um, second or third date. And the next day, I. Um, I, I met up with her and, and I was like, man, I, I was up so late last night, I got slash dotted. And, and she's like, slash dotted? Is, is that like sloshed? Uh, and I had to explain, no, no, it's, it's not me who got hammered, it's my, it's my website that got hammered. So um, anyway, she thought that was pretty cool once I explained that. And I, and I got about a million page views over the next few weeks, so that, that, that's pretty nice um, for someone who's not Justin Bieber. And then I uploaded my code to, to GitHub, um, as you do these days, and other people build on my work to do other modifications to the embedded controller firmware. So Hamish has a talk next up um, about what, what he did with his keyboard. Now, my tools don't work with the latest Lenovo laptops because um, I haven't looked deeply into it, but it looks like there's now signatures on the EC firmware. Uh, there's an open question here. Okay, um, this, this does prevent some malicious attacks um, modifying EC firmware, but you know, it's got a bit of a chilling effect on your ability to tinker with it. Um, what, what I'd really like is for all hardware to have some sort of means to unlock the bootloader, disable secure boot, et cetera, so that as a tinkerer, I can get around that without, uh, without you know, doing crazy things. In practice, of course, anything that you have physical access to can be broken with sufficient determination. So I reckon if I had sufficient determination, I, I'd probably get around that signature scheme somehow, like, like connecting to it via JTAG again. So that, that's, that's all for now. Um, I think I still have 10 minutes, so I can take some questions. All righty, who have we got? Right at the front down here, Mark. So first of all, very cool, obviously. Uh, good Thank job. Um, so I'm curious, my ThinkPad um, will not even charge a genuine battery unless the power supply is 135 watts as determined by a little resistor uh, value on the tip. Uh, even if the battery, if the laptop is shut off, it still will not charge on a 90 watt power supply, forcing me to carry a bigger one for no reason. Mm -hmm. um, would that kind of hacking allow changing some broken behavior I, like this? I, I would guess so. Um, I obviously haven't looked into it, but I would guess that that sort of check 
for the power supply would be done in the embedded controller as well. So it's quite possible that um, it could be modified. How long did this whole process take? And compare that against the cost of just buying a <laughs> battery. So, I know it's fun. So a battery uh, in terms of time cost would be heaps cheaper. It probably took me about a, a month of on-off on hacking to, um, to solve this problem. Um, but it was the principle of it. Um, further questions? We've got 10 minutes left. Once you had a key for the EC firmware, did you not reconsider just uh, dumping via JTAG and, and rewriting? Or was it still the access problem that was keeping you from doing that? It, it was the physical access problem. I didn't really want to um, have to get access to those. But basically, the, there's not a JTAG connector on this board. You have to solder to some resistors. And uh, this, this is my primary laptop, so I didn't really want to uh, take it all apart, solder to some resistors, have to hook up the JTAG. If I did brick it, then I would have gone down that path. But uh, yeah, I was trying to avoid doing that. I've got one more. I've actually got one. Um, people may have noticed recently there's been this big thing about the new Intels having JTAG built into the USB-C ports. I think that would, might solve your next problem with the new Lenovo laptops, if you can do the same thing. Do it's, you think probably, it's probably not the same JTAG bus that's connected to the embedded controller, I would guess. Cool. Thanks very much for all that. It's good, that's good progress. Um, I'm wondering, have you spent any other time looking at the other stuff in the embedded controller um, and sort of either mapping it out or asking what could I, what else could I get it to do? So I have poked a little bit. Um, in terms of the, like there's 192K, obviously not all of that's code. Um, I've only looked at maybe 10% of the code. Um, so I haven't really looked at that much other than the stuff that I needed to look at. Um, the, the next talk, um, Hamish will talk all about, so he wanted to change the keyboard maps, so he had a look at a slightly separate bit of code in the embedded controller. Um, so for historical reasons, basically, the keyboard controller is the same chip as the embedded controller. So there's also keyboard controller code in that same chip. Did you find where those um, warning and shut-off messages were stored, and, and could it be attacked from that end so it gets a bad response and then does something to stop everything working the, after that? Uh, the warning messages are in the BIOS, but they don't actually change the behavior of it. So uh, the, lock, the lockdown is done in the embedded controller, and then the BIOS reads those bits and uh, just displays the message. So changing that wouldn't help. Um, I might have missed a detail here. Did you know when you bought the battery that it was likely to have this problem? Um, I didn't, no. Um, and if you, if you look at uh, the, the way, I mean, if you, if you read this text, manufactured to be compatible, I guess you would, you would guess that it's a not, not genuine battery. But like, you know, the title is Lenovo 445N1079. At the time, I didn't even think, you know, uh, should I be buying a genuine battery? This uh, seemed to be the right battery for my model. Do you have any thoughts on why they bother selling batteries that don't work? So my, my guess is this may work in a different laptop. Um, obviously, Lenovo will have some batteries that are used across multiple laptops, and some may be locked down, and some may not be. Uh, Maybe. Do you have good fire insurance on your house? <laughs> so, so I've had this for a year. It hasn't burnt down yet. There's, so there's an interesting uh, question here of, uh, of you know, um, are, are these cells more dangerous? Now, just because I buy a Lenovo battery doesn't mean it won't catch fire. Uh, ba basically, there's sort of two categories of failures in lithium-ion batteries. There's, there's cells that have internal shorts and other failures where, where the cell combusts, and no sort of battery protection circuit will protect against that. It's basically a, a question of cell manufacturing quality. Um, then there's the protection circuit in the battery, which will protect you against uh, overcharge, um, over-discharge, short circuit, etc. 
Um, my, my guess is that any battery that's SBS compliant, including these um, dodgy ones, um, has a protection circuit of some sort. Um, and it's probably, it's probably sufficient. Um, you know, how much, how much do you want to trust that? Um, I don't know. I mean, yeah, this is, this is a long, long question. I, I would guess Lenovo battery may be slightly better at quality control. Is it less likely to catch fire? I don't know. They, they both have like probably a one in a million chance of catching fire. Um, so with the second challenge response mechanism, did you actually dig further into it after the fact? I, I didn't. I, I didn't work out what, it, what either of them were. I actually have thought about um, you know, working out what they are for, just, for, just for interest, but no, I, I didn't try and... The reason I say that is because I have a huge pile of old Lenovo's and um, I've accidentally put four T430 batteries in T420s and I get that exact same message. Okay. And the reverse. Interesting. That second challenge. So it's yeah. basically, it, it, there's a lot of cases where IBM have simply reused everything and uh, it's turned around and you go, oh, exactly the same thing. Yeah, interesting. So the older battery just had the first challenge, maybe, and then they've added the new challenge. I can't see any more questions. I think we've still got about five minutes left. At lunchtime, um, yeah, go on. if you want some show and tell at lunchtime, I've got, um, I've got a disassembled battery controller here from my old Lenovo ba laptop, so you can come and have a look. This is not really a question. It's more a comment. Um, I've had similar with battery chargers um, in Dell. They use a one wire, and the battery might be okay, but the um, the charger um, it, it just rejects it. Yep. <clears throat> and and I, uh, that comes back to the comment before about um, the the Mark made about uh, the the charger not certain chargers not not charging and i suspect all that sort of stuff is implemented in the embedded controller so in theory it would be possible to modify is that it was there any more oh i wrote right the very back you oh, you're gonna make me lose weight aren't you <laughs> thanks tim Is there any reason you can think of that there, apart from the safety issue, which I guess you can say, you could say whether that is a valid concern or not. Let's assume it is slightly a concern. Why is there all this challenge response stuff in the batteries? Do you think it's purely just to sell more batteries? I mean, I don't, I don't see why all this extra engineering. I, mean, I, I, I think, I, I mean, I think those are the only two reasons. Um, one, which is, would be the, the official Lenovo reason, is safety, um, and then the other reason is to sell more batteries. You know, how you allocate um, those two reasons, well, it depends on how cynical you are, but, um, but yeah, those are the two reasons. I think um, we've got time for just one more, if there is one. No, I think we're good. Well, I think that's it. Thank you very much for your talk. Thank you. And... I do have a gift from linux.com.au. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. So uh, we've got a 10-minute break until...